All right, good morning church, good morning. I'm actually recording this in uh, two different cameras here, so whether I'm looking at this camera or this camera, uh, I'm hoping one of these will work out. We're just trying something new here, so I have a backup as well. I hope you're having a fantastic week. Thank you for spending some time with me this morning. How many of you know that God is good? God is good. Today we're supposed to be riding the motorcycle, so I'm praying it's great weather. We're going to be heading up to Sandpoint. It's going to be beautiful. I'm so excited just to be able to uh, just enjoy the beautiful country that God has given us. You know, we were talking about this yesterday at our men's group, uh, just really thinking of... of just the blessings that we have from God and, and the term that came up was fellowship in the Spirit, fellowship of the Spirit and, and it's it's based off our memory verse there in Philippians 2, 1 through 4 and I hope you're memorizing that, Philippians 2, 1 through 4 uh, for our dinner which is coming up and that is uh, June 26. It's a Saturday night um, and it's going to be at uh, 6 o'clock here at the church and um, so definitely if you've memorized those scriptures please work hard on those and, and come be a part, let us know and, and we want to bless you. It's going to be a great time of celebration but we, we asked this question about the fellowship of the Spirit and what that means means to you and it just kind of you know we were listening to the conversation and, and we were having great fellowship with one another and, and uh, you know what it means just to just to have this constant conversation uh, knowing that the Holy Spirit lives inside of our lives and and how exciting is that and I began to think as, as I was just listening to the men uh, discuss this that also when you have fellowship with one another uh, really you kind of begin to rub off on one another and so uh, you know as, as one begins to share the rest of us kind of get encouraged and and as, as so and so shares, you know, we encourage and we start to think like-minded. And the more you spend time fellowshipping with people, uh, you kind of, kind of, you kind of begin to rub off on one another, and you begin to, you know, share stories and, and share things that that they were sharing, and, and how important and how true it is too if we have fellowship with the spirit knowing that he lives inside of us and the more that we spend time with him and the more that we just listen to him uh, that the things of the spirit will begin to rub off on others and it'll begin to speak uh, go forth and that our lives will really begin to represent more of Christ the more that we just have this fellowship with the spirit so anyways all that being said I'm not really preaching on that and uh but I just wanted to share a little bit of really what God's doing, how exciting it is to be uh, with a group of men that uh, want to get together, study, pray, uh, pray for their families, pray for their uh, loved ones, and um, it really is encouraging. So a couple of announcements that we have coming up here. We are still looking for a church in, intern, and so it's, it's an opportunity for those. You have to be going at least into a junior of high school. We're looking for juniors on up. Uh, there is no top age limit to this, and so if, if you're interested in that or you know someone that might be interested in, in just kind of learning some of what the church is doing, you can, you know, we're going to teach office skills, we're going to teach, uh, help you find um, whatever skill set is you're looking for. And so you'll be learning computers, office programs, uh, budgeting, account, you know, uh, the whole works, uh, planning, and so uh, maybe you'll do some time in youth, in children's, uh, and if even preaching, you know, you, you ha might have an opportunity to even preach or lead small groups. So uh, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to invest in young leaders, but we do have that available. So there are applications here at the church. Please let us know if you're interested in that. Um, Fourth of July, we're going to be doing a barbecue, and Lord willing, we're going to try to do an outdoor service if the weather is nice, and so uh, that's going to be super exciting, but we're going to have uh, hot dogs and, and uh, just a great time of fellowship outside, and we did that all last summer, the... Um, uh, the outdoor services and I loved it so much and so we wanted to do something again this year so 4th of July we're planning on doing something uh, outside uh, uh, followed with a barbecue as well so come be a part of that and finally youth camp is coming up um, we need you guys to help you know try to get uh, signed up if you're interested in going the cost is only a hundred dollars which is amazing and so for a full week at camp if you're interested in going or know some kids that are going and this is for middle school through high school uh, please let them know the information, let them, uh, have them contact us so they can get signed up and ready to go. It looks like there's a link here. I'm going to try to put that in the description below. So if you want to sign up your kids to camp, you can just click that link and get signed up and be good to go. So fantastic. With that being said, let's pray for our youth, our kids. Let's pray for uh, the motorcycle ride, which is going to be going on today. And let's also pray uh, for our tithes and offerings. So uh, just bow your heads. May Father, we just praise you, Lord, that we can come together and worship you. God, you are such a mighty God, Lord. We are just so grateful 
to be able to spend time, Lord, studying your word, Lord, and, and learning about you. Father, I pray for those that are going on the bike ride today, Lord, and that you just, your hand is upon them, you protect them, you keep us safe, Lord, as we just uh, travel, Lord. I pray that you bring a godly fellowship, Lord, and brings us closer together as brothers and sisters in you, Father. Lord, we lift up our kids, our children, Lord, as they're finishing school, Lord. We thank you for the graduation that just happened the other day, Lord. And a couple of our youth that are, are getting ready to head on the next chapter of their lives, God. I pray that uh, the rest of the kids help finish up their school strong. Lord, I pray for our children today, Lord, and our grandchildren, Lord, that Lord, there's just this hunger and passion for more of you, Lord, Lord, and for learning about the things of you, God. I pray for us, uh, uh, our teachers, Lord, that they just share the truth. Father, and then, Lord, we lift up uh, our Sunday morning tithes and offering. Lord, we thank you for everything you've blessed us with, Lord, for what you've given us, Lord, for just the ability to, Lord, give back a portion of what you've given us, Father. We know our blessings come from you, Lord. I pray that you bless those that can give, Father, and those that can't. I just pray that you bless them this week so they have something to offer you next week. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. Bless now this word. We ask this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. All right, well... It's a little bit later, so I've already drinking my coffee. Now I'm starting on water, so here we go. <clears throat> I want to start this morning. You got your Bibles with uh, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. We've all, well, maybe if you've been in church, you've heard this multiple times. If you've been around me enough. Uh, you've heard me share it multiple times, and it's this. Go, therefore, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20 says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, this is something we talk about, uh, the Great Commission. This is what Jesus has called us to do. It's what we're commanded to do. It's what I will continue to teach. Hey, listen, we need to go and share the gospel. We need to go and do this. We are called to go. God has given all of us this uh, responsibility, this commission to go and share the gospel. And sometimes I think we just make it too difficult. We get a little too complicated. And, but I love how Peter and John really begin to share it. It's found in Acts 20. I'm not going to turn there, but they're kind of getting persecuted. Uh, they're being told, listen, you can't share the gospel anymore. And what do they say? Is that we can't help it but to share what we've seen and heard. You can't, you, we just can't, we can't stop. We, we want to. We, we have to. We're compelled to share what we've seen and heard. And I want to encourage you that when I say we're called to go and we're called to share, it's really, it's this simple. It's, it's not having to know the entire Bible by, by heart. It's not having to understand the entire uh, salvation. Method. It's just share what you've seen and heard. What have you seen? What have you watched God do? I think one of the questions I'm going to ask um, our church here today is, what is it you love about your church? What are some things you love about your church? What is it that gets you excited? I know for me, uh, last Sunday, it was, it was amazing. I love watching the church be the church. I love watching the church uh, minister to one another. And, and last Sunday, I just asked, you know, hey, who needs prayer? Let's pray for one another. And, and we watched as people kind of gathered around and, and the elders and, and the prayer warriors and, and just people, we begin to pray for one another. And I get truly blessed watching people worship God and pray and minister and be the church. And so, uh, uh, to me, it's, it's such a blessing. I love how, how, uh, how awesome our church is. So, what is it you love about your church? What are you excited about? You know, what have you seen? Begin to share that with others. It should be contagious. You know, how many times have we seen something uh, really neat happen this last week? And we've like, man, did you see that? Did you witness that? And so, how can we not share what we've seen and heard? And so, you know, for those that are uh, extroverts, for those that are doers, for those that like to are go-getters, uh, it's pretty easy to say, all right, let's go. You know what? Hey, Jesus said go, let's go. And away they go. And it comes very naturally. And see, because anytime you give them any sort of task, it's, all right, let's do it. It has to be done. And so, um, I took a skills test. And believe it or not, uh, I, I, I took the high five test. You can take it online. Um, it's high five, uh, the number five dot com. And uh, it'll give you back kind of top, some of your top five skills. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and here is here is my my top one. I was I was an activator. And here's what it means it says uh, when can we start? 
This is me. This is a reoccurring question in your life. You are impatient for action. You may concede that analysis has its uses or that debate and discussion can occasionally yield some valuable insights. But deep down, you know that only action is real. Only action can make things happen. Only action leads to performance. Once a decision is made, you cannot not act. Now this, this describes me, and I give this to all of my staff, I give it to my board members, I give it to new members. I said, listen, you wanna know a little bit about me? Here, here, here's what my top skill was. Uh, I wanna see things happen. We can talk, 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 but you don't, hey, let's just dive in, we'll figure out. And, and right now I'm in the middle of trying to uh, build my wife a, a, her own little space to move all this stuff in, and I'm learning how to sheetrock and mud, and, and I'm, I'm learning as we go. And, and yes, I've had lots of people offer me help, and I appreciate that, but you know, I'm just kind of stubborn enough that I was like, I want to just, I want to learn how it works. I want to learn how, you know, what to do, what not to do for next time. I love just trying to figure out how to do things. It says, others may worry that there are still some things we don't know, and but this doesn't seem to slow you. If the decision is made to go across town, you know that the fastest way to get there is to go stoplight to stoplight. You're not gonna sit around waiting until all the lights have turned green. Besides, in your view, action and thinking are not opposites. In fact, guided by your activator theme, you believe that action is the best device for learning. You make a decision, you take action, you look at the result, and you learn. This learning informs that your next action and your next, uh, this learning informs your next action and your next. How can you grow if you have nothing to react to? <laughs> well, you believe you can't. You must put yourself out there. You must take the next step. It is the only way to keep your thinking fresh and informed. The bottom line is this. You know you will be judged not by what you say, not by what you think, but by what you get done. This does not frighten you. It pleases you. Now, for me, it's easy to say, all right, hey, we need to tackle this project. Let's just let's just dig into it and we'll figure it out as we go. We'll begin to learn. The challenge for me comes when I need to wait. I need to wait. I've titled today's message, hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. I've realized it's more than just getting stuff done. It's about it's about what God has called me to do. I know that I need to do what, not just what I need to do or what I want to do, it's, it's about what has God called me to do and am I, am I doing what God has called me to do when God calls me to do it. See, there's a big key here because so many times we think, well, as an activator, as someone who just like, yeah, we've got to get things done. Okay, well, let's, we're just going to keep plowing forward and we're going to figure it out as we go and you know what, when, when this problem comes, we'll, we'll deal with that when it shows up. Now, uh, Glenn. Uh, my trusted administrator, he is a great balance to me because I'm like, let's just go forward, we'll figure it out. And he's like, well, you know, maybe we should actually take a look at a few of these scenarios. And he plays, uh, uh, what's the right term, um, worst case scenario all the time for me. And I think it's probably part of his disaster uh, uh, readiness uh, mindset, which makes him great at Red Cross, but uh, he likes to think things through. And he asked me multiple times, you know, well, what if this happens? Whereas I'm just, let's go for it. Whatever happens, we'll figure it out as we go. It also lends me to give people more chances and opportunities, real, uh, and then try to fix the problem later, clean up the mess later. So it's, it, there, there is a balance, but it's about what does God call me to do? Am I doing what God calls me to do when he calls me to do it? It's something I'm still learning, and I still fail at it constantly. I think about this last Sunday. Uh, we were at prayer last Sunday night, and, and we're actually canceling prayer tonight because of graduation parties and stuff, but we were at, you can, so you can still pray at your home, but uh, we were at prayer last night, and I was going to think, Lord, you know, we had a great Sunday, things are going on, and, and God really convicted me that it was a great Sunday, but as soon as church got over, I was instantly thinking about this class I was supposed to go teach right afterwards to finish up a membership class, and, and I kind of brushed off a few people that I really felt God convicted me of that I need to spend some time praying for them. And so, it just kind of reminded me that, listen, God is... God has called me to do things, but I need to be obedient and I need to be listening to what he calls me to do when, I'm, when he calls me to do it. 
I don't always have to rush to the next thing. I need to hurry up and wait and wait. I don't have to hurry. I need to be obedient. I still have a tendency to rush through things. So here we go. In our reading plan now, I don't know how many of you guys, if you're following the reading plan, praise the Lord, and uh, you're right along with me. We've been going through Song of Songs, and um, that's an interesting book. That's all I can say. And I know I've, I've taught everything in this book is in there for a reason. Uh, I still don't know quite yet why all of that is in there, but you know what? Maybe one day I'll teach out, but not today. Today we're going to Ephesians, uh, which is uh, a little better for, for me to teach. So Ephesians 6, uh, let's start in verse 1. So turn me to Ephesians 6 is where we're going to be at today. <clears throat> It says this, verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Oh, man. Computer, don't make noise. I said, um, all right. I, I don't know why this is going on. I, see, see, technology. If, if you struggle with technology, you're not the only one. Occasionally, technology just does its own thing. So here we go. Verse 2, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And verse 9, And masters, do the same thing to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. And this is Paul reading this, and, and anytime I like to dig in the scriptures, you know, we think about, you know, who, who's writing it, who's he writing it to, but this is Paul teaching, and, and, and number one, the first thing I see, and it's right there in verse one, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obedience is key. So if you're taking notes, number one, obedience is key. Obedience is key. Why? It says, honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and that you may live a long time. These are so many reasons why obedience is key. The first step to understanding what we're supposed to be doing, we have to, to if we want to know what God has called us to do or when God, we have to learn to listen to him. Children understand um, that if they do what they're supposed to, they won't get in trouble. My kids know that as long as they follow the rules and as long as they do what we ask them to do, they're not going to get in trouble. You know, the same thing comes with us. Now we think about the Ten Commandments. You know, here you say, children, obey your parents. Honor your father and mother. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Not the Ten Great Suggestions, it's the Ten Commandments. Look at what it says. Now the Ten Commandments are found back in Deuteronomy, so let's just flip back there real quick. Deuteronomy 5, verse uh, 16, and this is where it lists all the Ten Commandments uh, in Deuteronomy 5, or also Exodus 20, I believe. <clears throat> it says this, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with you on the land which the Lord your God gives you. Did you catch that? The reason why we're supposed to honor our father and mother, it teaches so many values, but more than that, it says also, it says that it may go well with you. It's, it's healthy. Obedience will keep you healthy. What do you think about that idea? Obedience, following the Lord, listening to God, honoring your father and mother, is so it goes well with you. Obedience is part of honoring your, your parents. All these things is... I, I was told once by a guy, he said, you know what, of all the Ten Commandments, this one's the most important because it teaches you to understand authority. Honor your father and mother. Honor your parents. Obedience keeps you healthy. It will give you a long life. Obedience keeps you from getting in trouble. Obedience is key. To understand what God wants to do, we have to learn to be obedient. Paul uses the example of slaves. Now, uh, slaves is a term we don't like to use today because, yeah, there were... the there were some awful things, but uh, back in this day, there was slave. Now, we may um, switch that term because uh, uh, to employees, or maybe I'd even say interns, right? 
they're not our slaves. I, I hope you don't, please don't be offended. Um, we joke it, but look at what verse 6 says in, in, back here in Ephesians. Ephesians 6, 6, and it's talking about slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to your flesh. And, and maybe you could take this and say, listen, employees, be obedient to your employer. See, they're paying you, right? Um, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart is to Christ. Do you treat your employer or your boss like you would treat Christ? Not by way of eye service, as men placers do. Now think about that. It's not by, oh, quick, here comes the boss, look busy. I remember that when I was young. Uh, for some reason, I used to I used to help my dad out, uh, my real dad, and we'd do landscaping. And, and you know, he'd kind of put you all to work, and you'd be raking leaves or something like that. And actually, any job I've had, it seems like it always, you know, the foreman, you know, he leaves you guys all to work. The foreman decides, all right, I'm going to back, and, you know, i got to go check on some other, whatever they go do, or get some coffee, or, or whatever it is, all right? So they all take off. And, and I kid you not, it happens more times than not, it feels like you work, you work, you work, and then, and then, all right, let's just take a five minute break, and as soon as you sit down and take a five minute break, here comes the boss, come back. And what is everybody doing? And it's, it's this idea that there's also the other, the flip side to it is like, here comes the boss, quick, look busy. And what he's saying is, is it's not just about working for your employer, it's about, he says, like is this, but as slaves to Christ, as an employee of Christ, as, as a worker of Christ, do you work at your job as if you were working for Christ? Is that how you're representing? Is that the attitude you bring? Because here's what it says, doing the will of God from the heart. You see, it starts with the heart. If we don't change the heart, we won't want to obey. We obey not because we have to. We obey because there's a change in our heart and we want to. You see the difference? See, if, if, if I'm trying to obey the commandments God has, if I'm trying to be obedient to what He's called me to do, and I'm just trying to because, well, if I don't, I'm going to get in trouble, I'm always going to be struggling with following His commands. But see, once the heart changes, once the mentality changes, then now it's no longer like, oh man, i got to make sure I do these things. It's, it's now I desire and I want to do these things. It changes. The, once the heart changes, then the rest of it just falls into place. We need to make sure that we're not the ones who start making the plans. <clears throat> now, I'm talking to myself. I, I, I told you, as an activator, it means, you know what? Hey, I'm going to, uh, let's just go for it. Jesus said to go, let's go, right? <laughs> We need to make sure that I, I hurry up and wait, that, that uh, I'm not the one that's saying this is the plan that we're supposed to be doing. I need to make sure that I'm listening to our Father and doing His will. So many times we're just, we just do things to be doing things, and, and, and that's good. But more importantly, we need to be listening to God. We need to be, really, kind of gets back to what we were talking about yesterday, the men's, that's the fellowship of the Spirit, that if the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, then I need to be spending time with Him saying, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? We need to hurry up and wait. We should be waiting on the Lord, not the other way around. Did you catch that? We should be waiting on the Lord. We should be ready. God, where do you want me? All right, I'm ready to go. Where do you want, do you want me to go this way? Do you want me to go this way? Not him saying, all right, hey, Jose, it's, it's, it's time to go. We need to go. Uh, I, I remember when our kids were younger uh, before they started driving. And, and uh, how fun is it to get ready to go to church with, with small children? Um, now, praise the Lord. My wife is pretty easy maintenance. And I, I'm going to tell her at church tomorrow, right? Uh, she gets ready to go. Uh, and we get go. We say, hey, uh, we're leaving at you know such and such a time. Be in the car or you're staying home. Now, now, now think about this. When dad says it's time to go, right? Be in the car or we're leaving. You should be in the car before dad gets there. I'll never forget when we were younger. Uh, first time probably I met my, one of the first few times I met my in-laws. And uh, before we were married and, and we, were, we were up here and we were, we're getting ready to go to church. They said, all right, hey, we're leaving. And, and uh, Katie's little brother, he's not little anymore, but Marshall, he was, I don't know, he was dawdling or something or I don't know. He didn't get in the car. And we seriously left him. I mean, I'll never forget this. It was like, 
All right, Pop says, time to go. If you're not in the car, I was in the car, and we were driving to church, and Marshall was chasing us. And I thought, well, ha, this will be funny. We'll just stop. No, he said, hey, it's time to go. We're going. And I say all this because as children, we need to hurry up and wait for the Father. We need to hurry up and wait for the Father. And this is what God is calling us to do. Obedience is key. He says, all right, hey, I want you to get ready. I want you to be prepared. And then I want you to listen and wait for when I tell you to go. Get yourself ready and be prepared to go when God says it's time to leave. All right, number two. So number one, obedience is key. Number two, dress properly. Have you ever heard the term dress for the job you want? Uh, my wife, uh, yeah, she makes fun of me all the time because the clothes I wear, I still wear the same. I, I, I like athletic shorts and t-shirts. It's simple, tennis shoes. I wear tennis shoes all the time. I just need one pair of shoes, that's it. She actually made me get another pair of shoes that I wear to church. I leave them in my office, and I put them on on Sunday morning so people, you know, so, so it looks nice. And then when I leave, I put on my tennis shoes, and away we go. But it's, it's kind of, you need to make sure you dress for the, the dress properly. Uh, different jobs require different dress codes and uniforms. Uh, my son just started working, and yeah, he's got to wear you know black pants. And he's got a nice little polo that he wears, and you know I don't know if he has a hat or not, but sometimes you know some of them they have to wear a hat, and, and you have this uniform. And there's a few reasons uh, why uh, you um, why you're supposed to dress properly. And I think about it today we're going to. Uh, you know, we're, we're out here on the motors, we're going to be taking a motorcycle ride. And, and I think about the people that, um, you know, when, when you get ready to go ride on the motorcycle, uh, no one out here, experienced riders will know that you got to wear the right gear. You're not going to be out here in flip-flops riding your motorcycle. Um, yeah, there are a few people that, that ride crazy, but experienced riders know that it, it's a matter of time and, and they dress properly. They, the, the really good ones, yeah, I'll be wearing tennis shoes. I'm, I'm still working on it. Uh, but... Uh, other riders will have nice boots, right? They, they know they don't want shoelaces getting caught in, in chains or spokes or anything like that, right? And so they, they have a nice set of boots that protects you from even the mufflers and stuff that's hot down there. Uh, most people will be wearing pants. Some may be even wearing chaps, right? Uh, the leather protects, uh, you know, your legs. And, and then you have, you know, your vest or some... Uh, I actually have a jacket that has uh, little armor plates in it. You know, I think about all that. Uh, you know, we got our helmet and and your gloves and you know your glasses or face shield. You know, all these. You you wear the right gear. You ha need to dress properly for what you're doing. Dressing properly when you ride does two things. I think about this. Why is it important to dress properly? Well, number one, uh, it it offers protection. You know, everything. We, you know, we put the helmet on. It offers protection. Uh, you know, we, we have we have uh, um, you know a face shield or all the, all these different things. And, and number two, it shows what team you play for. I think of I think of football. Uh, you know, for for motorcycle riders, you know, they'll wear their patches and kind of shows who they're riding for. Uh, you know, I, th I think of football. You know, the same thing. You got cleats and you got you know your 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 football pants and it's got pads. You know, at certain areas and you know you got your shoulder pads and your helmet and all these things. And but also you you're wearing a specific color which shows what team you're on. So it does two things. To when you dress properly, it does two things. Number one, it it protects you, and number two, it shows what team you're on. In the next section, we read about this armor of God, and this is why I want us to get is about uh, dressing properly, the armor of God. So let's go there. Chapter 6, let's keep going, verse 10, here we go. <clears throat> 10 through 17 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the, uh, resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, 
uh, which is the word of God. Okay, so we just kind of listed all these things and talking about dressing properly, talking about the things that we need to put on. And I love what it says right here in verse 13. It says, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Wow, we, we live in crazy times, right? And there's a lot of stuff going on. There's... Uh, I think a lot of temptation is coming. There's a lot of division coming. There's a lot of things we don't agree with. But you know what? It's been going like this for thousands of years. You know what? In this word, we read about, you know what, same thing. Uh, divisions, wars, uh, things that we don't agree with. Um, and... And how do we deal with it? How do we continue to stand up? It says we have to wear the armor. We need the armor of God to stand up. We need to put on our armor and stand firm. You know, I almost might read it like this. Hurry up and get ready and then wait. Get dressed. Hurry up. Get dressed. Get ready. And then wait. Wait. God didn't say. He said, he said stand firm. Hurry up. Get ready. And stand firm. Don't be swayed this way. Don't be swayed that way. Don't be running over here. Don't be chasing things. Don't be wasting your energy. Wait. What has God called you to do? Sometimes the most difficult thing to do is stand firm. We start hearing, you know, this thing come down the news or talk radio and something. Like, oh, man, that, that, that's a good idea. Let, let's go do this. And then you hear someone else. Like, oh, you know what? You're right. That That's a little. Let's go over here. I, li I like that. Oh, I need Oh, all right, let's go, let's go. He says, hurry up. He says, get dressed and stand firm. Stand firm. Let's take a quick look at the six pieces of armor found in this. And I want to encourage you, I'm not going to go into a deep study with these, but I want to, as, as you're taking notes, I want to encourage you this week to, to maybe dig in a little deeper to each one of these. And so, he kind of talks and he starts, you know, his shoes, the belt, uh, the breastplate, the shield, the sword, and the helmet. And I'm going to just look at these right from the ground up. And so let's start first. The gospel of peace, they go on the feet. You know, I mean, the, the gospel of peace goes on the feet. Think about what the gospel is and what that means. It means that Christ came to die for us. It means that God came down, took on human form, and, 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 and died on the cross, paid the ultimate sacrifice for my sins. He did something that he didn't have to for me. To atone for my sin, he basically paid that sacrifice for me, that gospel. And, and, the, and now think about the peace that that brings. He says, listen, I care for you. Christ cares for you. And when you know that someone cares that much, when you believe that someone cares, it gives you this sense of peace. It means it doesn't matter what happened. And, and, and I would almost like it to this that... You know, you think of your father or someone that you really trust, right? And someone that you really look up to. And you know that when you're with them, you are safe. You know that no matter what happens, as long as, I, as, long as I'm next to this person, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be safe. And you begin to think, now I can sleep well at night. Now I can rest well at night. See, we don't. When we know we're safe or we believe we're safe, it's easy to rest. It's easy to have peace. And peace is what goes on your feet because when you're afraid, it you, you begin to run. Fear does two things. It locks you in place, right? Or, or it pushes you to move. And when you're not at rest, sometimes I do this. I'll just, I'll just pace back and forth, right? I mean, I need to walk it off. How I many of you go for a walk like to, you know, to relieve stress? And, and all these things are okay, but he's talking about, you know what? You want to be able to stand firm? You need to have that gospel peace on your feet. It's going to help help you relax and stay where you're at. Peace will allow you to stay grounded. <laughs> I put it like this. It's like having cleats when everyone else is wearing sandals. Have you ever play, played football out in the snow or have you ever play, have you ever played football or something where you're the only one wearing cleats and everyone else is wearing tennis shoes or sandals or flip-flops or something? It's like yeah, you run circles around and you're like, hey, you didn't come prepared. I don't know what to tell you. But, you know, think about it. it, it it's having your footing solid. And it starts with that gospel of peace. All right. Next, he talks about girding your loins with the, 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 the uh, gospel or the, um, what's he put it here? Uh, the, with, with truth. Um, we mark it down as the belt of truth. 
you wrap this around you. Now we're all seeking truth. I think about it. You, you wrap, you know, I think of what a belt does. Yeah, it holds your pants up, but um, I almost think of it like a, a safety harness. And, and I used to work on uh, roofs. I was a roofing foreman, so it used to be, you know, up high all the time. And, and, and you know, sometimes you would, you would tie off, you, or you're supposed to tie off, right? And, and it, it kept you safe, for one, but also kept you from going too far one way or another. Sometimes when you're working on high equipment or stuff, you know, you might, you know, harness in. And it keeps you from swaying too far to the left or the right or, or from getting hurt. The truth is your protection. See, we're seeking truth, and the importance of truth is the truth will keep me from going too far this way, or too far this way, or falling down and getting hurt. So you need to have this solid base of what the truth is that's wrapped around your, your, your center and your core, because we talk about... Okay, yeah, here we are. Back back to coaching. Hey, hey, you get free lessons in coaching. You know, we, we tell people, hey, watch their hips. Where their hips go is where the body's going, right? You know, they can do all these things with their legs and the head fakes and all these different things. Watch their hips. The hips will lead you right where they're going. And the same thing, he's saying, listen, wrap your hips with truth. Gird your loins with truth. Right here in the center of the core, because if we have truth, wherever the truth is going, that's where you will go. And so we need to see the importance of, of, of what really truth is. And, and, and place it right there, because it, it keeps you grounded, and it keeps you from swaying to the left and right. Let's keep going. Breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, it protects your vital organs. It's right here in the middle. Uh, specifically, your heart and your lungs. Let's look up this word, uh, righteousness in my sword. Uh, if you have it on your phone, I actually wrote it down here. It's a condition acceptable to God. Righteousness. Okay, righteousness means it's a condition acceptable to God. It, is my heart right? If, if, if I'm doing what's right, if, if my body becomes a condition that's um, acceptable to God, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's integrity. It's virtue, it's purity, it's the correctness of thinking. These are the things that will protect our heart. You know, we think about you know, out, of the mouth, uh, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. We understand about the importance of changing the heart, to protect the heart, to protect the lungs, to protect the breath, the things that come out. It says we need to be doing these things. It, uh, we need to make sure that we are living a life of integrity. That's what protects us virtue of purity and if you're straying to the left and to the right if you if you're not taken captive you're not going to be protected you're not going to be protected it's important to have the right uh the the correctness of thinking i love that because it's important when our hearts are right our actions will be right you know that you, you really we do what we want to do like if i want to go to uh, I find ways to do what I want to do. So if our if my heart is right, my actions will be right. And we need that righteousness to protect our heart and our lungs. All right, let's keep going. Sword of the Spirit and Shield of Faith. I, I love these two I, um, because it, it's so neat to think. The, these are the weapons that we hold in our hand, right? And uh, um, these are the parts of the armor. Now catch this. These are the parts of the armor that we control, Right? We're holding weapons in our hands. These are the ones we can swing. These are the ones we block. These are the ones that are moving. See, the, the belt, it, it's, it's around my hips. The, the, the breastplate, it's around my chest. So wherever my chest, it, it's, it's attached there. The feet, they're attached there. But see, my hands, this one's used for fighting. Now, I, I'm right-handed. So, you know, the sword, the sword of the spirit is in the dominant hand. It's what I cling and I hold on to the most. I take my strongest hand and I hang on to the sword. And, and what is the sword? It says this. It's the word of God. You hold on to this, the strongest, and there's anything that I can tell you today and that you can get from this is hold on to the Word of God. Hang on to the Word of God. Get to know the Word of God. And it's so important, I think, is, which is why we keep pushing the Scripture memorization, uh, why we want to celebrate and bless you guys for, for hiding God's Word in our heart. Now, we don't have to do that, but we do it because we value the importance of the Word of God. And if you're not in this, you need to be. And if the only time you're reading the Word of God is when you're listening to me, it's not enough. You're starving yourself. And so the Word of God, this has to be what we hang on to the strongest. We have to be able to, it's the only way we fight the enemy. It's with the Scripture. When Jesus went and battled, when you know, Satan came and tempted him, what do you say? Everything he, he went back to telling him was, was, was the Word of God. And when the enemy is attacking you, 
and when the enemy is lying to you, we can only fight him with the word of God. That's why we hold on to this the strongest. The more you dive in, the more you dive in, the sharper your sword will be. <laughs> how, how great an analogy is that? The sharper your sword will be. You'll be able to cut right through. The other part is the shield, right, which goes on your, your offhand. It defends us. It defends us. It protects us. The enemy's going to continue to throw darts. And he says this, it's the shield of faith. Faith. What an amazing word. It's about the things we believe in. It's about trusting God enough to do what he says. I mean, it's, it's all these things. Faith. As your faith grows, so does the size of your shield. I love this. You know, and some of you guys, maybe you start off a little saucer, or a little tiny plate here, but or buckler, maybe that's the official term. But uh, as your faith grows and you realize you begin, your walk with God begins to grow, the shield begins to get bigger and bigger. And pretty soon the enemy is having such a hard time because they know how strong your faith is. Every, every time he throws a dart, you're like, yeah, get away from me. It's, it's not like... It's not like fiery arrows anymore. It's like Nerf gun darts, right? And and your shield just it blocks everything. And pretty soon it, it's covering your whole area. And you're not worried about it because your faith is growing. And you know that the enemy has no power over you. It's essential to defend ourselves against the arrows of the enemy. I'm reminded by, um, <laughs> yeah, well, ironically, we're, we're going on a motorcycle ride. And, and uh, I remember when I first got my bike, it didn't have a windshield on it. And, man, the first time you got out there and you get on the highway, it's like you almost have to lean into it. You have to hang on because the wind's just blowing against you. And uh, for those of you that, that don't ride, um, there's a lot of things out there uh, that hit you. <laughs> and if you don't have a windshield, it's, it's quite easy to get hit with bugs and rocks. And, and, uh, and even if you just have a little tiny windshield on the front, it'll start to deflect that air up and over the top of you. Now, I have about a half windshield, so I can see over the top of my windshield. I don't look through it. But it'll protect even more. But, you know, I do still have, uh, I've had rocks glance off the top of my helmet. I've had bugs and grasshoppers, you know, smack you in the face. Uh, probably the worst are bees. And, man, when you're going through a place like where there's bees, you're like, hung, yeah, like you're trying to hide behind this little windshield just to protect yourself from all the bugs and, 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 and bees that are, like, just flying through. But think about it. As your faith grows... So does the size. Imagine so does the size of your windshield, right? And and then they have full windshield. Then you, Jim, man, my stepdad, he's got, he's got the full ferry, man. He's got like a little heater up there, a little radio. He can, he. he I guess his faith must be bigger. I guess that's how it works. <laughs> but think about. I just want you to picture that. That as your faith grows, as you begin to learn more, and you begin to understand the authority and the place you have. Uh, so does your shield. So does your protection. All right. Finally, the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. The helmet, the helmet protects your brain. It protects your brain. It protects your thinking. It protects letting your mind wander. Now, I have a couple helmets for my motors. I actually have three. I don't know why I have so many, but because uh, I really want one, one. One is to be legal, yeah. So, and, and most motorcycle people, you are, you have a little tiny helmet you wear, and, and I wear my half helmet more often. Uh, I just enjoy it better. Um, but it doesn't offer that great a protection in reality. Um, I have another one. It'll protect, uh, that's like a th uh, three-quarter uh, helmet, and it's got a shield in the front, and that protects, you know, pretty good. And I actually have a full face helmet. It has like a, a strap down here, and it covers, it protects the eyes. It's got a shield, it protects the eyes, it protects my ears, it protects my head, uh, it keeps it warm, all these different things. And so we have different helmets that protect the entire thing, and I want you to think about this that the helmet of salvation will help you understand the authority you have in Christ. See, when we understand what salvation means, and we think about this, um, the enemy wants to get you to doubt that you are his, that you are, that, that you are Christ, that, that, that Christ has saved you. The enemy wants to get you to doubt uh, that you're even capable of being saved. The enemy says, listen, you are not worth it. You've messed up so many times, it's, it, it doesn't, you can't be saved. And Christ says, listen, I died for you. And that assurance of salvation, listen, saying that, listen, God, I've given you everything. I've given you my life. 
Lord, come be Lord of my life. Lord, forgive me my sins. I want to follow you. Once we once we say a simple prayer like that, it says we teach ABCs, accept, believe, and confess. We just say it just like that. We believe in our heart that he rose from the dead and died for our sins. And he says, then you'll be with me in heaven. And it's like having this protection. We understand, listen, you can't separate me from the love of God. You can't, you can't take me out of his hands. Christ died for me. Once you understand that, that you're Christ, that you're God's, your authority has changed. I want you to get this. A child of the king is entitled to different privileges. My children, right, they take on my last name. Uh, they can say things, and, and, and they're allowed different, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, areas they're allowed different um, privileges. I hate to say privilege; it's not even really the right word. But imagine if I was even more important, right? Uh, <laughs> imagine if I was God. Imagine if I was the president. Think of the president's kids, right? They're allowed in different places that that some of the rest of us aren't. And and here he's saying, listen, as a child of the king, once you've been saved, once when God says you're now my son, an heir to the throne. Now, now our authority's changed. Now. Now, I don't have to listen to the enemy. See, I, I hope you guys understand this, that the authority you have in Christ, you don't have to no longer listen to the enemy's lies. You can say, hey, listen, I'm a child of the king. Get away from me, Satan. But see, Satan's going to do everything he can because he knows if he can get your mind thinking, he knows that if he can, get, he can just wiggle his way in there and begin to get you to doubt, he also knows that he can get you to do other things. Because, see, Satan also knows the rights of God's children. Satan knows that he doesn't have authority over you. Satan knows that if you say, hey, you got to go, he has to go. He knows that, but he doesn't want to give it to you freely. He's still hoping you have that small little shield down there that he can throw the darts over and around, that he can get you to doubt. This brings me to my last point. Prayer is your secret weapon. Your secret weapon is prayer. It's It's prayer. See, the mistake that I think we get into is that we think we can do it ourselves. So, uh, point number three, prayer is your secret weapon. Thinking we can stand firm on our own. Really, you know, I'm, I'm a strong guy. I got pretty good faith. I can, I can stand firm. I can, I can hold the line. Th think about this. Think of the best swimmers you know. Uh, I am not one. Actually, I'm getting better at swimming. I think I'm getting a little layer that helps me float a little better. I think that's what it is. <laughs> uh, but think about the best swimmer you know. And you say, hey, you know what? You just go tread water in the ocean. And some, I don't know, they, they can last, I don't know, hours. Uh, it'd be like minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. See, the only way, they can't last forever. You can't tread water forever. It's impossible. You can tread for a long time, no matter how strong you are, no matter how good a swimmer are. You can do it for a while, but you can't do it forever. See, the only way to stay in the same place requires some sort of flotation device. You need some sort of lifeline. And see, that is Christ in our lives. Christ is that lifeline. So he says, hey, listen, hurry up and wait. Hurry up and stand firm. But listen, you don't have to do it yourself because I'm going to be helping you. I am right here beside you. See, the armor of God is talking about Christ. When we look at really the armor of God and what he's talking about here, he's just referring to things that they talked about in the Old Testament. A lot of that's found in Isaiah. And it's representing Christ. And he's saying, listen, put Christ on your feet. It'll help you stay still. Put Christ. Christ is truth. Put him around your waist. He will keep you from moving to the left and to the right. Put Christ on your breastplate, right? Across your chest here. Protect your vital. It's all about Christ. Christ. Helmet, Christ, faith, Christ, uh, the sword, right? Which one did I miss? All those things. He's talking about Christ, but prayer is our secret weapon. This is how we battle. Look at what it says here. Verse, we're going to finish up the chapter here. Verse 18. It says, with all prayer and petition... Pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the openness of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that you also may know about my circumstance, how I am doing, Tychicus, 
the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will make everything known to you. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, so that you may know about us, that he may comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. We must pray. Church, we must pray. Prayer is important. I, I, I know I said we canceled prayer tonight because we must pray. You don't have to set aside a specific. It doesn't have to be a time. We must pray. Fellowship of the Spirit. It's about being constant prayer with the Spirit. Paul says, pray continually. I love that. We must pray. Pray to know God's will. Ask God how long you need to wait before you move. Hurry up and wait. God, where do you want me to go? I'm not just going to go just to do things, just to be doing things. I'm going to go when God tells me to go. Lord, what is your will for my life? Pray to encourage one another. We need to pray for one another. Some of us are struggling. The body of Christ, right? I say this. Pray, intercede for your pastors. I need your prayers. Pastor Brian, Glenn, uh, there's pastors all around the world. We need your prayers. Pray for your pastors. Intercede for your pastors. Intercede for our missionaries. Intercede for our evangelists. Intercede for each other. We must be praying for one another. We need to pray that God, that they keep moving. That they don't get discouraged. That the Lord begins to use them. That the Lord begins to speak to them. Pray in the Spirit. Let your spirit pray. If you've given your life to Christ, your spirit wants to pray. If you've given your life to Christ, you said, Lord, be Lord, your spirit wants to pray. Uh, this is one of the most difficult things I think to talk about. You know, we, so many times, you know, we pray with our mind. We pray with what we're thinking. And that's, that's great because, you know, hey, God's laid this on my heart. I'm going to pray for it. But we also need to pray in the spirit. And here's what Paul's talking about. It's his Pray at all times in the Spirit. And this is a tough one, if you haven't learned it, but, but we need to continue to pray. We need to, God to, to, to ask. We, we need to ask God to just open up our prayer language. We've all been given a prayer language. You've been given a prayer language. Now, I want to encourage you, don't fake it until you make it. Uh, I'm not telling you this. Don't just say, I'm habba da habba da habba or whatever it is. Um, that you want to get out there. We're not just trying to just fake and make it, but what I do want to encourage you is don't completely say, well, I just had bad experiences, so I'm not going to think about it anymore. We need to pray and say, God, I want my spirit to pray. I want to move. Lord, open up my voice. But here's the thing. You may want to hurry up but there's times you have to wait. Hurry up and wait. God, open up my voice. I want to pray. Hurry up and wait. See, prayer fights the spiritual. Prayer fights the spiritual. He says right here, Paul said back in verse 12, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our battle isn't against flesh and blood. It's against the spiritual. It's against the enemy. He's con Satan is continually trying to attack you. And if you're trying to attack him with what you know, it's not enough. You have to fight him with this. We can only win with God's help. We will not be able to stand firm if God is not helping us. We can only stand firm because he's our lifeline. It's the only way to stand firm. Demons don't flee in the name of Jose. I hope you know that. Demons don't flee in the name of Jose. They only flee in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, actually says, you know, they came back and, and, and the, the people were all excited because they said, hey, the demons had to flee in the name of Jesus. They were, they were fleeing. He says, absolutely. The demons are subject to the name of Jesus. The name, uh, the very name of Jesus causes demons to flee. James 4, 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will have to flee. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will have to flee. This is how we hurry up, submit ourselves to God, put on the full armor of God, get dressed properly, 
And then get ready to stand firm and wait. And wait. Praise the Lord. I want to close in prayer with this. Thank you, number one, for spending time with me if you made it through this whole thing. Number one, I said obedience is key. Now listen, if you've been struggling to hear from God, sometimes we talk too much, but if you've been struggling to listen and hear from God, and you want to hear from Him, him again, you just need to know, Lord, where do you want me? Lord, help change my heart so I can know where to go. If that's you, I want to pray with you today. Number two, if you've neglected some of the armor of God, you have not dressed properly, and you need to put on the whole armor of God. You say, yeah, you know what, I'm pretty good on this area, but not so much on this. Maybe my, 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 my shield needs a little bit of work. My helmet feels like I'm, I'm just wearing the half helmet. I need to get that. I need to understand the full helmet. I'm only wearing one shoe. I don't know what it is. But he's talking about putting on the full armor of God. And if that's you today, I want to pray with you that you put on the full armor of God and get ready. Three, and this may be a tough one. Prayer is your secret weapon. And if you've never prayed in your prayer language, and it's a language of just allowing your, your spirit to speak. And I want to encourage you with this and, and how we do this. I want to pray, if, if that's you and you want prayer, that God will open up that prayer language. I want to pray with you this morning. And I want to encourage you this. As you begin to pray, pray in English. And then just wait. And if your mouth begins to, to speak... Let it speak. And you don't have to do it in the middle of church. Do it in your closet. Do it in your car. Let it speak. And I promise you, as you begin to pray in the Spirit, it'll, you'll know if it's from God. Because you know what? Your, your soul will feel refreshed. It'll feel refreshed. I, I promise you. Let me pray with you. Father, we just thank you for each and every one here, Lord. Number one, Lord, we talked about obedience is key, Lord, and I, I pray for those that, we, Lord, we've been struggling to listen to you. Lord, we've been doing our own things. Maybe we've just been plowing ahead, Lord, and I pray that we just, we, we take time to stop and wait, Lord, and listen for your voice. We'll hurry up and we'll wait until you call us to move, Father. Father, I thank you, Lord. We talked about dressing properly, Lord. I put on the full armor of God, Lord, and I pray for those here that, Lord, maybe we've put on some or, or maybe we've neglected to even put on any. And we haven't been dressing properly, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you, we put on the full armor of God, Lord, to protect ourselves against, Lord, the enemy, Lord, that's out there that's fighting us, Lord. And, and maybe we've been straying one way or the other, or, or Lord, wherever we've been moving, I pray that you, you ground us once again in your word and in your truth. And, Lord, we put on the full armor of God. Father, and finally, I pray for those, Lord, that, Lord, maybe have never spoken tongues. Lord, have never used their prayer language. And I pray, Lord, that you just release this prayer language, Lord, in their lives. God, that we let the Spirit speak. We let, we let our soul speak this morning. Father, and, and I pray that we don't get impatient or frustrated, Lord, but we hurry up and we wait on you, Lord, because we know that it's in your timing, God, all things are possible. God, continue to be with us. Continue to be our lifeline, Lord. Help us not just to tread water by ourselves, but to hurry up and stand firm until you've called us to move, Lord, not to be swayed. Thank you for what you're doing, God. Thank you for being with us. Father, I pray you just watch over this week. Father, keep us safe. God, give us an opportunity to share your love with someone else. Keep us safe on the motorcycle ride, everyone that's out riding, Lord. Bless the trip. We thank you for what you're doing. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless. Have a great week. And I hope to see you again next Sunday. Bye.